so thankful and grateful to God for you today. Uh, without you, there would be really no us because it takes all of us to make us. Mm -hmm. Thank you for making the time. You have shared uh, with others to tune in and I want to express my heartfelt thanks to you. Let, let me say in advance, Merry Christmas to you and to your family. You. We will have Bible study on next Wednesday. Uh, which will be the 27th, but before the 27th, the 25th is going to come if the Lord don't come soon. Mm -hmm. Oh, how I wish he would. Uh, so much is going on in this world. Uh, the signs are pointing to the fact that Jesus is on his way yeah. back. Yeah. And he's coming back for saved folk, not just for anybody. Mm -hmm. Let me also say thank you that you have been with us, many of you, all year. You have been very diligent and dutiful, and I'm so grateful and thankful for your, your presence and your participation. I also, first and foremost, want to thank the good people of our church, uh, many whom you can't see, and yet we're so grateful and thankful that we've been able to share and gather together. As always, the Word of God takes first and foremost and first place in our lives. And we don't just study it just to study it, but we study that we may grow thereby. Yeah. And growing means that you get better, that you move from where you were to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. That also means that change has to take place, be it a change of lifestyle, change of behavior, change of conduct. And I want to thank those of you that, that have been coming. Uh, your commitment makes all the difference in the world. So let me... Let me whisper a word of prayer, and then we will move into this study today. Even now we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let, let, me, let me have your attention for just a few minutes, if you will, because we need to kind of refresh back up so that we can reconnect, like uh, trains that are on a track, so we can pull all of them together. We, we, we looked at last week that this verse 24 and verse 25, mm -hmm. that it is what is known as a doxology. Mm -hmm. And a doxology and a benediction are not the same. Mm -hmm. Let me rephrase and refresh your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a benediction is actually a prayer in which we're asking God to bless and protect and guide the people of God typically at the end of a worship. Mm -hmm. And that's why I believe that it's important that before you run out, if you can stay long enough while the benediction or blessing is being offered, that you would stay. Uh, I don't know about you all, but I want all the blessings I can get from God and some. Amen. And because I don't know what he knows and he knows more than I do, then I want him and asking him to help me in advance. How about you? Amen. They just waking up, you know, don't worry about it. They ain't had all the coffee yet, caffeine, hadn't gotten into the system. Uh, some of them are a little chilly. You know how it is, a little sheep. They got to get warm because their little wool has not made them what they need to be. But anyway, moving right along, we're talking about a doxology. And a doxology is an expression of praise to God. Mm -hmm. And in that expression of praise, those expressions in that element of praise remind us of his blessings. But at the same time, glory is given to him. Mm -hmm. And the role of the Trinity is affirmed, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. in the life of the believer. Mm -hmm. When we start walking through this, Look, if you will, at verse 24 again. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, mm -hmm. present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Right there in that verse, look at it with me again. This matter of what God is doing and protecting is so important because if you just read it and you don't know what you're reading and understanding it, you might miss wealth and you don't want to run past it. He keeps us. And we understood last week that that is a military idea 
that talks about to guard or to watch over, mm -hmm. to, to keep watch over, mm -hmm. uh, to have an eye on, mm -hmm. to never let you out of his sight. And, and right there, that, that, that's enough that ought to make you know that you can be confident that no matter what's going on, that God is not just watching out, but he's watching over you. Yeah. And, and this is not just some one moment matter. It's ongoing. Now, what you think about that? That there's not a, a moment in your day that God is not watching out for you. That there, there's not a moment that's going on in your life. There's not a situation that he has to be briefed on. You're not going to update God about anything. Uh, you, you don't need to remind him of anything because he knows everything because he's in control of everything. Yes. But then not only that, uh, we also get to see that him guarding us, watching out for us, looking over us is from a preventive perspective, not from a punishment posture. Mm -hmm. He is looking to keep us from stumbling. And it's a matter of an illustration or an analogy that speaks about a sure-footed horse mm -hmm. that for the rider, he doesn't have to worry about skidding, sliding, because the horse that he rides on is going to stop when needed. Yeah. I'm telling you, we got a God on our side mm -hmm. that is able to keep us, even in the most slippery situations, that we have ever entered into our life. And I think it's important that we really understand from a connected perspective. Here's what Jude is saying at the front end in verse 24, but he doesn't stop talking because we got verse 25. And so I think, I know it's important that we truly understand exactly what it is that Jude is saying here so that we can completely follow the train of thought. What is not just what he's talking about, but who he is talking about. Mm -hmm. Let me share with you before you read the lesson. We're not expanding this just to saturate time and fill in a calendar. We are exploring, taking our time, molasses movement through the text. So that you will gain insight and get great appreciation for what God's word is saying. Because if you just read it just off the top, uh, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our, Father, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and ever. Amen. You'd have to ask what did you just say? Mm -hmm. What does all that mean? Mm -hmm. It's like the Ethiopian eunuch who left church, sitting there in his chariot, reading his scroll. Philip is sent by the Holy Spirit to come alongside and ask him a simple question. Do you understand what you read? Mm -hmm. And let me say this, class: that reading the Bible and studying it is not the same. Just because you read a commentary don't mean you study the Bible. You gotta dig deep. You gotta understand word language. You've gotta understand much about content. You've got to understand the history. There's so much that goes into study of scripture. And that's why you need a pastor, mm -hmm. a shepherd. Amen. That's why you need to be in a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. Yeah. It ain't enough just to show up and sit in a pew you need to be a recipient of God's word and somebody who's going to cut it straight and tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So let, let's, let, let's look at the lesson. Uh, because this is the final note of Jude's letter. It's filled with a statement after statement that applauds the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as Jude concludes this doxology, because that's what it is, he brings it to a close with several theological truths about God, and I believe it's important that we do well to investigate what is in these verses, what is in this series of texts that reveal why the Lord is worthy of our worship. Let me stop you for a second. We see car, cars that are sold online. Don't read your lesson, please. 
you can go to Carvana and you can buy a car sight unseen. They can give you all the information, tell you all of the options, but let's just keep it real. Anybody with any purchasing savvy is not going to go online, buy a car buy because of a picture, and you ain't never drove it. Let me have your attention. You, you mean to tell me you spend that kind of money and buy a car and you ain't never cranked it? You've never sat in it? And you're going to take for granted just because of a picture that it tells you everything you need to know about it? Uh, you can say, well, show me the car facts. That's fine, but, uh, you know, how does it feel? Well, you can't determine how it feels or the ride, or the suspension of it, or the comfort of it, or the amenities, or the accessories, just from a picture. Got to go get in there. Yeah. Got to touch. Turn some knobs on, even stuff you don't even know what you're touching. Something about the smell of the leather of a brand new one. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. I know it's been a little while. Yeah. And some of us will just go just to sit. Just a wish. He said, where are you going? You ought not to ever sit in worship and just wish when you can worship the God who wants you to know. Yes, sir. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. June is wanting them to know who they sing to. Mm -hmm. Do you really know him? I didn't say you know his name. Because it's easy. Yeah, I know the Lord. Um, how well do you know him? Do you know what he wants? Do you know what he wants for you? Not just for you, but do you know what he wants from you? And if you know what he wants from you, when you sit in worship, you ought not be mute mouth. Even if you're out of tune, you ought to at least be trying to sing, we come to worship God. Let, oh, I need to say something. Because we're living at a time where people have inverted the meaning of worship to think that it's something they're supposed to come get. When, no, worship is what we give. And it is a matter of ascribing to God what he's worth. Yeah. Well, the question is, how much is God worth to you? Is he worth getting up, coming to Bible study? Oh, it got quiet. Is he worth you coming to worship on Sunday? I, I, I thank God for those that say yes, he is. Because the showing up ought to validate the fact that says, he, he, oh yes, he's worthy and he's worth all of that. And so uh, Jude's doxology brings comfort and encouragement and it reminds believers of the faithfulness and the power of God. Think about that. Think, think, let me ask you this while we're talking. How faithful has the Lord been to you since January? Y'all are for quiet. Uh, uh, I'm going to try it again. Can you hear me now? Yes. How faithful has God been to you, 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 you since January? Uh, so faithful that you can't clap loud enough or long enough to pay, to, to render thanks back. Hello? How good has he been to your children? How good has he been to your family? Since you still here, it's, it's December. You and I are about to make a 12-month full-scale ride here. That ain't everybody's, that ain't everybody's report. You still here with aches and pains? Limited sight, limited step, but you still here. God has been faithful. Now, let's, what about you? How, how faithful have you been to him? You mean to get up 10 minutes early just to rise, even sit on the side of the bed and have a moment of prayer is too much? You mean to tell me that he, as faithful he's been, when we ain't been faithful, 
that he ain't worth reading the Bible before you leave the house on in the morning, that he ain't worthy of you praying, and I ain't talking about asking him, don't read the lesson, please, but just to say, God, I want to thank you. I ain't coming asking you for nothing. I, I just want to tell you thank you. When I look at my life and I look at where I am, I could be a whole lot worse off than what I am. Because there are some people that will trade places with every one of us in here, including you. And yet look at what he has done for us. And Jude says that he has been watching out for us, watching over us, protecting us. Even when we thought we were doing it. Even when we didn't give him credit. Even when we didn't even give any thought about it. God's been good to us. And he's been keeping us from stumbling. Yeah. But I want to tell you, a whole lot of our stumbling is not because God ain't able. It's because some of us ain't willing to obey. Oh, some of us have been hard-headed. Yes. You know, you ain't got no business eating no pork chop. And you got high blood pressure and ain't taking your medicine and talking about God's going to heal me. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. God helps us as we line up and submit and obey. You, you honestly think God's going to do it in light of how hard-headed and stubborn and stiff-necked we can be? Why should he? Why, why, why should he? If we want the blessings of God and the benefits of God, we ought to at least be obedient to God. And so when we look at this text, And I've sought to show you aspects of it, both from your transliteration from the original language to whether you got New International Version, uh, New King James, King James, Revised Standard, English Standard Version, New American Standard Version, uh, to now what the original language has to say. The first part says, from the transliterated version, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen. We ain't going to cover all that. We're just going to cover part of it. And next week, we'll finish up looking at this aspect of the aspects of, of our Savior, glory, majesty, dominion, power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen. And maybe we ought to spend some time talking about why. Amen is capitalized and why it's not a small A. All right. All right. The transliterate translation of that from the original language actually reads, watch, look at the look at the look at the parallel. And I and I and it's almost like a parallel passage study from one language to another. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, mm -hmm. because of him, that word th through there is the Greek word dia, through. He is the avenue, the channel through which we're talking about in him. Uh, be glory, majesty, might, and authority. Watch this. Before all time. That's why I like to slow read and slow walk through. Well, before all time takes us back to eternity past. Wow. Both now. And forever. We'll catch that on next week. Amen. He not only protects us, he presents us. A Jew concludes the letter with swelling praise to God. He describes God as the only God, our Savior. Not the third one or the fourth one, but the only one. Which puts him in a category that only he and he alone occupies. He has no competitor and he has no comparison. Think about the exclusiveness of that. If, if I were to say this is the only set of eyeglasses in the world and they didn't make none out of it, no more like this, it can't be duplicated or replicated. Think about how distinct that is. That's what he is saying about God. God is so unique in and of himself. That they ain't no clothes, no, 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 no one, nobody has power like him, nobody heals like him, nobody saves like him, nobody delivers like him. Because he's got all power. 
And although these apostates, these rebellious non-believers, worship themselves as only one God, and he saves from, saves from sin all who will trust him and his son, Jesus Christ. And so Jude scribes gives to God inestimable, indefinable, undetermined worth, sovereign rule, omnipotence. That means he's got all power. How much authority? Full authority. And he offers this praise to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the one mediator, the one who stands between man and God. Let me have your attention. Our prayers get answered because Jesus prays that the Father is going to answer them because of him. Your prayers ain't answered just because you pray. Your, answers are, your, answer, your prayers are answered because there is divine acceptance. God wills it so. Let me have your attention. I'm glad you got faith. I, I'm glad you trust. But let's be clear. All of my prayers ain't been answered. Oh, uh, Okay. Um, I got some witnesses in here. We didn't ask for some stuff. The Lord said no. We had trust. We believed. We knew he had power. But he got the last word. Let me have your attention. That's why you got to be careful about some of these lies these folks are telling that all you got to do is believe and receive. Um, I wish it was that simple. If it ain't, do you ever, and, and, yeah, is it by the will of God, according to the will of God, do we ever ask God, what do you want from me, from me, in this situation? Many times we take to God like, we got this wish list, give me what I want, I know you can, and I'll be waiting on it in a few days. Well, what is God's will? What does God want? Does, does anybody care? Are you interested in what God wants in light of what we are praying for and praying about? I don't know what you're praying for. I don't know what you're praying about. I don't know who you're praying for. But did you ever stop to ask the Lord, Lord, what is your will for him or her in this situation? What is your will about this? that I'm asking for. Yes, yeah, my heart's desire, but do you want me to have it? Do you not want me to have it? Because you know, if I get it, how I might act toward you. How it might make me think more high, highly of myself than I should. And, and so, Jude describes to God all of these wonderful matters. And he offers his praise through the Lord Jesus Christ, the one mediator between God and man. If we didn't have Jesus on our behalf, we'd be done for. This is the only place in scripture, listen to this, where you're going to find these declarations concerning Christ that are knit together. Well, let's look at it. To the only wise God, our Savior. That's powerful. We end by considering what we believe about God, and that's theology. Informs us how we worship God, that's doxology. And it directs how and why we share the gospel of God, and that's our missiology, or that's what our mission is. As he ended the pit, this letter, Jude offered praise for the present self, for the present salvation and the future glorification of believers. And he begins to to who? The only God. And that echoes the distinctive Jewish confession that's been passed down throughout the centuries. Let me have your attention. Here's where a good Bible study comes into place. When you talk about culture, when you talk about knowing the background of the, te of the text, the letter, you got to know all this stuff. It ain't just a matter of reading some out some commentary. You, you got to do your homework if you're going to feed folk correctly. 
you, let me have your attention. Go read, please. H how would you feel if you went to a restaurant and you asked about a menu item that they don't have no picture of and the waiter or the waitress said, I don't know. You, 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 you're looking at um, where it says crab mushroom, but it don't give no, 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 no description of it at all. What, what, what can you tell me about it? I don't know. I, sh I just work here. Excuse me? No, I just, I just get food, whatever they cook. I, they put it on your plate. I just bring it to you and you eat it. I don't know, I don't know nothing about no mushrooms. I don't know about no mushrooms. I don't even care for them. How would you feel if your waiter or waitress talked to you like that? Well, no teacher ought to talk or teach like that. No preacher ought to teach or preach like that. You ought to know what God's words say. Don't just read a text to me. Tell me something about it. And this is what Jude is doing. He's writing to, again, who is the audience? They aren't Americans. They aren't Russians. They aren't Japanese. They aren't Mexicans. They aren't Asians. They are Jews. He said, what do they got to do with anything? Everything. Because he takes them back and connects to that which they know because it is part of their history and their heritage. It's called the Shema. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. I wrote it out for you. Um, it's been passed down because the Jewish people have been bred and have known this and have grown up knowing this. He takes them back basically to their history where it says, and I made it and I wrote it for you, hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You say, what, what that got to do with anything? Stay with me. There was what is known as polytheism. The word poly means many theism God, the belief in many gods. Many means more than one. The Jewish religion and the Christian religion is monotheistic. Mono, one, theistic, or theism. Theism is the belief in one God. We're not like the Jehovah Witnesses who try to smash us for believing in the Trinity to say we got some three-headed monster. No, that's not so. No, our God is one God. Jewish people believe this statement. It goes back to the Old Testament, again back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And I just told you, it's the Shema. It's a prayer, but it is also a call to God's people to acknowledge that God is our God, our only God, and we are his people. We, we ain't got a God over here, God over there, God up there, God around the corner. You know, we got a God in the flower, God in the drumstick, God in the lights, God in the water. Uh, let me give you attention for a second. Thank you, Holy Spirit. When you look at the, the, the Moses encounter with Pharaoh in Egypt, where God demonstrates his power by turning water into blood, flies, frogs, lice, uh, darkness, those were actually, let me have your attention because you need to catch this, those were gods that the Egyptians worshipped. They were polytheistic, many gods they worshipped. God goes up against every God they got and beat them hands down. That's why they can say, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, that our God is not just one, he's the only one. The only one that can rain bread down from the sky. The only one that can make water come out of a rock. Uh, the awesomeness of who he is is really what is being shared. Are, are y'all catching this? And, and then several New Testament texts that support the oneness of God that is spoken about here in the 25th verse of Jude chapter 1. 
First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6 says, For there is one, how many? And how many mediators? One mediator between God and man. And guess who that person is? Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom. And that means a payment. It wasn't a down payment. He paid it in full for everybody. All lost people. Jesus didn't save saved folk. Jesus saved lost folk that became saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 6. Yet for us there is how many? One God the Father from whom are all things and from whom we exist. The one Lord Jesus Christ from whom all things are, are, all, whom all, are all things through whom we, keep on looking at this, we exist. Yeah. Right. Throughout scripture this fact has been repeated in Nehemiah chapter 6, 9 verse 6. In Psalms, the 83rd Psalm, verse 18. And in Psalms 82, verse 19. And in Psalms 86, verse 10. And John chapter 17, verse 3. And 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. And chapter 6 and verse 15 of 1 Timothy. And uh, Revelation chapter 15 and verse 4. I identify and list these texts. So that we're not just making a statement off the cuff. We've got Bible support that the scriptures drip with this reality of who our God is. And ain't nobody better than him. But you got to keep in mind, why is Jude making this statement? Y'all with me? Yes. But who is he making this declaration to? That's critical. Remember, there's an attack going on. Mm -hmm. False teachers have come in. Mm -hmm. Remember at the very beginning, he said, I wanted to write to you about our common salvation. The salvation that we have in common, it, and that we're common don't mean cheap and inexpensive. No, we've got a relationship in common because we got a connection through Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in the Lord. I want to talk to you about that. But the Holy Spirit redirected and wanted and needed me to say to you, here's a news flash. There is an urgent statement that needed to be made because there was some devilish, demonic, ungodly stuff going on by some ungodly people that were coming in seeking to divide the people of God. And it's still going on. Let me, let me have your attention for a second. I've been thinking about this. We're, we're living at one of the most treacherous times in history. And yet it's one of the most right times for the gospel. We're living at a time in, in a day where sin is taken center stage. Yes. Um, and, 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 and I'm going to tell you what's going on. It, it's getting to the place where the church is challenged to stand against it. It got quiet. When, when I hear on the news, that the Pope <clears throat> of the Catholic Church yes, gave an, a, a law mm -hmm. that it's fine and the authority to bless same-sex marriages. Okay. Um, I'm scared to talk about what I'm talking about. And if it bothers you, you might be on the wrong side of truth. I want you to think about this. Catholic fathers have been known to bless everything from a dog to a motorcycle. Okay. I'm telling the truth. Uh, and that matter of blessing that they quote unquote confer is that they want God to 
to bestow a divine blessing, hate to use the word, on a dog, on a motorcycle. Um, let's raise it. God, by the Pope's word, not the Bible, by the word of the Pope, and for many Roman Catholic people, when the Pope talks, it's almost as though God has spoken. Uh, look, I, I ain't, look, I ain't scared, and, and I know what I'm talking about. That there, there, there are people in the Catholic Church that will believe the Pope before they believe God and his word. Because after all, he's supposed to be the one next to God. That, that, that's what they, that's how they feel about it. Uh, I, I'm telling you the truth. And I want you to think about the strength of what we're talking about. That here is a man who would say on God's behalf and authorize other people who are under him that you've got the divine right and authority to confer a blessing from God on two men or two women in a man or relationship, and then they try to clean it up, but we still believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. You know, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth at the same time. How in the world are you going to say that it's between a man and a woman, but then God's going to bless a man and a man and a woman and a woman. We're living in a day like that. I, I, my, my wife said something that was, I, and I told her I was going to repeat what she said as best as I could. She said, we're living in a day where we ain't got to worry about them showing up, sitting in the pew, or meeting folk outside, hanging out tracks. We got them in the pulpit. Uh oh, uh -huh. that's, that's funny out of all the stuff I've been saying y'all ain't said amen pastor teach well we love you but as soon as I start talking about have open hunting season for rotisserie preaching y'all come hungry problem that I have with have is how many of us know that some of these fellas are treacherous and are dangerous and you still listening to them and how come you don't support the one you got that you say you love? I, I, I got a concern about that. And, and she made all the sense in the world. That, 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 that like the Pope, we got poisonous preachers that are taking a stand, since we're talking about homosexuality, on saying it's okay. I, I don't... I, Talked to a friend of mine the other day. Uh, that, that church was in the Methodist denomination. Methodist church has been divided over this matter of homosexual clergy. They took a Christian stand to let it be known we depart from identifying with the Methodist church because of your acceptance to sin, to say it's okay to have some homosexual male or female up there preaching who's got a male, male lover, female partner and go lead a congregation in righteousness while you living in sin? Now y'all see folk don't want to talk about it. Well, I will. Because I, 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 I'm going to be like the prophet. I'm going to stand on the wall and cry loud and spare not. Because I'm going to side with God no matter what way this go. Because God's going to have the last word and God is right. Here is a denomination and even here in Warren uh, that there's been, it's been not just the Methodist church, it's been some other denominations where folk have split in the Episcopalian church. This matter been fighting over some female preacher who's got a lesbian lover and they let her stay and keep preaching and leading. And, and, and I said to him, I said, so, so how do they preach against sin? 
You, you, you are the walking epitome of living in sin. How you gonna preach to them folks sitting out there, though they may not be of homosexuality, how you gonna preach to them about gambling, smoking, drinking, running around, fornication, and adultery, when you are the living embodiment of sin yourself? I tell you, you ain't gonna have sermons preached about sin when you've got preacher, pastor, even teachers that are living wayward lives like that. Amen. Amen. And this is what Jude is saying to them, that you need to understand. Be careful about falling for what appears to be when underneath it all, there is contamination. And this is kind of, this, this, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you this and then I'm going to move on. Because I'm mighty afraid that there are going to be some fellows who are going to try it. You know, they already tried it. That if the Pope says it's okay to bless homosexual marriage, don't think it's going to stop with the Catholic Church. There, there, there's some fellows right now that 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 won't preach nothing about sin like this while they look at people who they know live like this. I ain't saying you gonna change them, but how do you have mute mouth when you see wrong and do nothing about it? You say, well, it's in my family. No, I ain't saying you gotta change them, but you ought to at least let folk know. Dying in sin does not make one a saved Christian just because you believe in Jesus. Oh, hello. Oh, it got quiet in here. Uh, I'm done when I say this because your silence bothers me. So what do you think we got saved from in order to live like who? Like what we lived like before so we can just have Jesus as some green card when we get to glory. I got my card, got Jesus, and I can go on in. Uh, Paul says to the Corinthian church, you know, y'all was all over the place in your lifestyle, but you've been washed. I don't expect, Aber, to put no clothes of mine that are soiled in the washing machine with all of the right detergent and then come out and they smell and look the same way. Something ain't working. Jesus is effective against sin. And I think it's important that the church keep in mind that we're at a right place. Folk ain't gonna wanna hear it. And people can run and join other churches because that preacher over there ain't talking about sin like that fellow Rosh. Well, I wanna tell you, nobody gets a go pass. And if he's afraid of teaching and preaching the truth because he's worried about less money in the plate, then he's not really focused on what his calling is. I'm going to have to answer to the Lord. And, and I'm not preaching and teaching based on trying to get more folk in the house or money in the plate. I'm trying to get folk on the same page with the Savior. And so it ain't me they are against. It's him. And he'll have the last word. Well, I don't like every time. Well, you know what? Take it over to him. You didn't call me. I don't answer to you. I answer to him. But I'm not going to just stand and act like it doesn't exist. There's a calling I have to fulfill. Jude makes it clear that the Christian doctrine of salvation go hand in hand with the oneness of who God is. That there's only one personal, holy, loving God who made the world, who maintains it, redeemed it through Jesus Christ, and he will be glorified in it. And the him that you refers to here is none other than Jesus. He is the channel. He is the one of whom God's grace, mercy, and love, and forgiveness to fallen mankind comes through. He is God's God the Father's agent of creation, salvation, and judgment. We're going to stand before him. Every blessing and provision comes through him. 
And Jude makes it clear that there is only one. And he has the preeminence or the first place, not in some things, all things. So to say that he is the only one is to say that he occupies a place that none other can or ever will. Look at how absolute that is. And because there is so much love to so much to love about him, we are also in awe or respect regarding his absoluteness. Our finite or limited knowledge of God can only be made known and enlarged as he reveals himself throughout his word. Yeah. And the Jews understood the monotheism, the belief in one God, and the fact that God is one and he is one without division because the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they coexist and they are co-eternal. Paul writes to the Corinthians expressing the same fact in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. And this only God is the Savior coming to us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In order to save us, that what God the Father has planned, Christ the Son has brought to pass. And God the Holy Spirit applies to the lives of those who trust in him. They're working together. God made us, Jesus saved us, the Holy Spirit seals us. It don't get no better than that. And this is a faith that Jude is extremely concerned about, that his readers are going to pay attention to, that they will be prepared to contend for the faith. And remember, that is to stand strong on the word of God. Not simply for faith of just having or just believing it, but you've got to stand on it. And it is this theology, this knowledge of God, the way in which he has revealed himself in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that's going to give rise to this conclusion. And so it is in the New Testament, it is more common to connect Savior to Jesus. And I've given you this list of texts. Pray that you will take some time and read them when you are home. It's almost as if Jude comes to the end of this and that he is saying to those to whom he writes, do you even realize how great your God is? I, I, I'm telling you when, when you, when you break text down, when you look at scripture, more than you can ever imagine that he is great and he is worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. And it don't matter what Focus saying in light of what we are seeing that's going on, that thinks things that are being allowed, because uh, it, it, it's coming, y'all. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be fashionable, but it's fatal. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and not only will the preacher or Whoever is responsible for misleading folk and lying on the word of God, the folk that follow are going to suffer as well. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to get exempt. Mm -hmm. I pray God's word helped you today. Amen. I pray that you have gotten not just a greater knowledge of, but a greater respect and a greater love for him. I look forward to seeing you next week. Praise God today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray that your word will save somebody who needs to know Jesus as Lord and Savior and come to him and give themselves to him as you gave yourself for us. Thanking you for the moment. In Jesus' name we pray.